I always tend to put my emotion, my true emotions, not my kind of reactive emotions. Mm. Try and put my true desires first, see what I want to achieve emotionally, and then work from the top down to say, okay, what, what can kind of fulfill that on a daily basis, on a monthly basis? Go from there. Parenting and entrepreneurship, two of life's more complicated and demanding roles. What happens when you try to balance them both? Well, on the Parentpreneur Show, we give you an honest look into the lives of parents juggling both this situation, family and business. I'm your host, Michael J. Christian, and as a parent with my own entrepreneurial pursuits, I know the constant struggle of trying to do everything, but I also know the joy and pride of providing for my family whilst building something of my own. I'm pleased to have entrepreneur Luke Carter on the show today. Welcome, Luke. Thank you very much. It's uh, definitely a pleasure to be on the show. I appreciate your time. Um, to start, Luke, give us some of your background on your journey so far, both as a parent, but also as a businessman. Yeah, well, my, my, my daughter's five years old, so uh, and I've, I've got one daughter at the moment. Uh, she she feels like she's uh, multiples of herself. She's uh, she's definitely a live wire like I used to be. So I guess my journey as an entrepreneur has been quite lengthy. Um, when I was 11 years old, uh, and even before that, I'd always had that spark of how to put things together, um, how to put deals together, how to make money, um, and basically just serving uh, serving a need for someone. That was a deep ingrained passion as well, which I guess runs as an underlying tone to everything I do anyway. I mean, around 11 years old, I was um, uh, selling these, um, had a company uh, that was selling military uh, LED lighting products uh, in the UK uh, from the States. There was always kind of quirky things and delivering things to market that might serve a value. Um, always tried to utilize my creativity in that as well. So I guess over the years, I've noticed a theme of um, anything I seem to do or add to my bow. Um, I tend to have a few common themes in there, it has to help people, has to be creative, has to make me happy uh, and present a challenge as well. Uh, basically, it has to line up with my values. And that's been, even though the journey is obviously up and down, um, I, I don't really have any regrets with any part of that process. So, yeah, I mean, I've started various things since then. And um, obviously, we maintain um, business activities today. But, um, yeah, it's been an interesting ride. <laughs> So it, it sounds to me very much that you're value led as opposed to industry or sector led. So for you, it has to align with how you feel both. Well, first and foremost, as a person. Definitely. I mean, if you analyzed my my journey, you would probably see some of the sectors as potentially not random as such, but um, certainly not as related as you might, might think from the surface point of view. Uh, for example, I've been involved, obviously, in the lighting. I've been involved in um, technology, uh, in um, kind of uh, food and drinks, in automotive, uh, premium rate telephony, property. Um, but they've all had a, an angle to them where I was giving something back. I was creating something, uh, whether it's uh, creating a brand from scratch and offering something unique to the public um, or a service or something like that. Um, and the property was an extension of that. Obviously, my family has a, a history of property and things like that. Um, but there was definitely a core theme of adding value to people's lives. And that's something very much um, I enjoyed growing up in the property scene. Not only are you creating something, you get to impact people's lives on a daily basis. You get to enjoy your own spaces as well and uh, discover and push your limits all the time. So it has a lot of ingredients um, in there that I always make sure that are present. Well, I guess I've done it on a subconscious level from when I was younger and uh, I've always kind of maintained that uh, steadfast position of I'd always have to be true to myself, which, you know, sometimes you think, oh, at this particular moment in time, I'm, I'm, it's not a good idea being true to myself. It's so difficult. It, but it actually, I've just, the most powerful thing I never wanted to have was any regrets. Nice. I, I like that. And do you think there was a sort of single seminal moment in your kind of formative years where you went, this is what I want to do? Or was it kind of more, in, certainly in my case, more by accident than by design? Yeah, I guess growing up, um, it, it was an interesting mix. Obviously, um, as you know, my, my father played uh, professional football. And as a young age, you know, I'd see him around quite a lot after training. 
which is nice to have, you know, both parents around for sure. But it was the attitude growing up more than anything. It was that sporting attitude. My, um, my, um, obviously my mum's very driven as well and um, very um, homely. And that mixture of uh, kind of love and also achievement is very uh, was very paramount to how I would go on to form. It's presented its own challenges, obviously, because you know with sports mindset it can be unforgiving but then you know sometimes the world can be unforgiving and it's not meant to be against you it's meant to be with you so it took me some time to realize exactly how I was going to uh, unfold that process but certainly the values were forming all the you know all the necessary parts of the toolbox that I needed and I guess I've always been interested in how things work so from a young age I was very scientifically minded I'd strip down everything that I could all my toys rebuild them sometimes a uh, lot of people out of the house were taking the door handles off at a young age, all sorts of things. Um, and um, yeah, it's just an intrigue of how things work. And I guess that from that early age uh, of, of doing that, that just that very process, it just made me, it forced me into the mindset of doing things that I love to do. So that's what led me on to the path of, oh, hey, if I can find out how this works, well, how, how do I work? What makes me tick? So I'd always ask myself them questions from that early start. So I was always going to follow that process. And obviously the entrepreneur bubble is um, it's just ideal for exploring that. And that's what suited me down to the ground. Um, it was just that ever expanding um, field of possibilities. Um, already thought that everything was possible. I mean, I had other challenges like self-esteem um, issues to overcome, things like that. But it doesn't matter when you're, some of your cores, I've always believed that you should use your strongest points to raise your weakest ones anyway. And the weaknesses are very much gifts. Um, took me a while to realize that, but I think you can use the uh, pain and um, difficulty as massive leverage. I, I think that's a fantastic point. And from a personal perspective, I've got, um, I've got two kids um, and both of them are, you know, to use the, sort of like vernacular they're on the spectrum somewhere but you are spot on when it's a question of latching onto what you are strong at in mm. order to drag along the bad things not only is that a much more healthy and positive way than beating your brow because you can't do algebra or because you're rubbish at remembering dates and history but if you're yeah. good at something be it sport or be it uh, be it english do more of that and it, you know and sort of drag the other things along behind you i think it's a it's a good analogy for life as well. I, I was chatting to my bookkeeper yesterday and I said, oh, could you take a look at this other little business that I've got? And she said, yeah, yeah, so send me the login. She said, who's been doing the, who's been doing the books to, so far? And I went, me. And she went, oh dear. Um, because, you know, bookkeeping and accountancy is not my thing, but that's why you go out into the real world and find a team, don't you? And you build it around you. Absolutely. I mean, when I was going on a, an even more intensified path of self-growth, I um, always remember a golden nugget. I was doing this training on my subconscious and um, this particular kind of life coach chap um, was um, very much pushing the idea of the the uh, kind of the squeakiest cog gets the most oil. And that's not necessarily the best way to pr reprogram anything in life. Even if you're looking from the energetic point of view, you've got um, uh, X uh, limiting belief to reprogram. You're not really going to replace that program. The best you can do is instill... Uh, a lot more energy into the new one you want and obviously that's going to take preference over it over time when you put the persistence in so i i really thought about that so yeah of course that that's not kind of a ticket to avoid any of your weaknesses by any means but it's just reframing it all and um yeah it's been such a fascinating uh, process um doing it that way let's let's dive into that a little bit more because this is this is a rabbit hole i love um the power of the subconscious and and you talk about the squeaky you're right, the squeaky cog um, is a great analogy, but I think for more pragmatic things, if your accountant isn't coming back to you quickly enough, if you keep, you know, calling them, they're going to, you know, go, right, let's get him out of the way. But I agree, it's not necessarily the most appropriate route for becoming creative or developing something. I mean, yeah. go from analog with cogs, go digital with wiring. I guess yeah. it's a bit like kind of um, rewiring or circumventing a little sort of chip in your circuit that's not quite working how you'd like it to but you find better pathways well kind of neural pathways how how important do you think this is probably more a parenting question but 
equally relevant to being an entrepreneur. How important do you think having a robust and healthy relationship with your subconscious is? I think it's very important indeed. I mean, obviously we subconsciously program things into our children with our actions and our responses. What I've noticed actually a, a big test and a, a kind of a, a revelation that I tried to embrace early on was your children can teach you more than you think they will. Um, so being open to not knowing everything is uh, quite liberating really. And they'll often highlight things that you really do need to work on. And that self-awareness is so important to feed back into them. Um, and there's a lot of things I try to do differently um, and evolve uh, from what I did yesterday. And I try to listen to them more. And yes, I of, of course, I want to try and instill the values and belief system. But at the same time, I don't want to do it in a way that comes from where my own um, kind of uh, shortcomings were coming from in my own mind, my own limitations. I didn't want to put that negative slant on, oh, you have to do it for X, Y, Z reasons. Because so even growing up, it was a fantastic uh, kind of mixture of um, positive emotion and, you know, um, uh, striving to be your best um, but sometimes I would take it the wrong way take it against myself because that unique mixture of my character just meant that sometimes I would take it out on myself and uh, be uh, you know not speaking great words internally about myself not really understanding the full message so it's kind of understanding that every child is completely different um, and that I might need to tailor my approach um, it's not anything to do with instilling them right beliefs in in an X formatted way, it's how best that child responds. So that's becoming really apparent recently when, you know, um, my daughter's pretty sensitive and caring, which is unbelievable quality. But I think at the same time, it's very important to make them stronger for the world and not lose that caring side. Um, so going at it that way, I mean, I was talking to my dad the other day and, um, and obviously we've got a similar mindset. We want to, uh, you know, become the best we can and to, you know, not have a, not, not dwell on uh, things that are going wrong, but focus on the positives. But not everybody responds to the same kind of, initially I tried the harsher route because that's, you know, you, you've got to do this. You've got to pick yourself up. But I wasn't very nice to myself in that process, first of all. And then, you know, we were talking about a lot of, you know, professional sports mindsets. It's so strong and, and un, undeniably um, a lot, many times out of reach in people's minds in terms of, oh, I can never be that strong mentally, but, it's a lot of players that needed a, a certain, we were talking on the phone, and a lot of players need a, a different approach from managers, a, a softer approach, and they can still be absolutely world-class and the strongest people mentally, but it's just that different relationship. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. I'm trying to find a way that really does work uh, for her. Yeah, it, it, it's very true. Um, you, you, need a, you need to instill a, a degree of uh, resilience, uh, but also empathy and I've found through my own experience, which is like sort of nine and a half years long at this stage, my oldest is nine and a half, um, that telling them isn't the way to do it. It's actually, they won't listen to what you say, but they will copy what you do. Yeah. And I think that's 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 a key lesson I found. Would you agree? Definitely. Sometimes that one surprises you, isn't it? When they, they um, yeah, start uh, reading back things that you might have said or done and... Um yeah kind of does uh, show you up okay yeah you're right um I was actually wrong and um that wasn't very good of me either um so it's, yeah it's the massive um I've always been a believer in doing things by trial and error anyway that's how I learn I research and um it definitely works for me but yeah it's been an eye-opener um it doesn't really matter what I say it's more it's like that 70 percent subconscious of how you say it and what actions you take after um, and that's made me quite mindful of well, how am I presenting to the world? How am I? Um, I'm trying to use every kind of bit of uh, two way feedback to improve myself as well. Love that. It, it's like I, I say very often to myself, my clients, my kids, it's like how you do anything is how you do everything. You know, you mm -hmm. can't have these multiple, you can, but it's not healthy. You can't have these multiple egos. You just have to be kind of true to yourself. You have to show your real self in everything you do. Um, someone gave me a lovely analogy yesterday with respect we were talking about children and um, they were saying that there's millions and millions of trees in the Amazon rainforest but not one of those trees is identical 
Mm. humans are exactly the same we're living you know sort of breathing organisms and there's absolutely yeah. no reason that you know any one of us are the same so it's the challenge but it's also the excitement of both being an entrepreneur but also being a parent of having to figure out a puzzle which is constantly moving you know yeah definitely and there's also that that thing of that you know, you do, do you want to make them the same as you i mean is that is that a good thing to do sometimes it's not i guess i mean um You've got to make sure, like I was always told, to go for my own dreams. Um, sometimes easier said than done because, you know, um, there was always this, you know, uh, professional football was always like the, in many people's minds, the pinnacle career. You know, everybody wants to know about it and uh, talk about it. And often growing up, that was a challenge point. Uh, people would want to know um, how my dad was doing before I was doing. And natural, you know, not, not mean anything by it. And I thought, you know, there's so much kind of positivity for that career choice. And how how is my self-esteem going to grow? How am I going to feel good about what I want to do in life? It took me many years to just kind of literally embrace that idea and build my self-esteem. And um, I was always told to follow my dreams. And, but you've got to not only follow your dreams, but follow what makes you tick as well internally and build your own sense of confidence in the world and how you derive value many times I thought you know the answer was to do everything I could for people and basically not fill my own cup so whilst I love generosity I've made some changes over the years where I can actually give even more if I filled my own cup up first and it's that's, all come back full circle that that's a really really good point I love that we'll we'll, we'll circle back to the um touch briefly on on the professional footballer father in, in, in a little while but just one thing now in terms of your sort of constantly evolving entrepreneurial journey what is your focus upon at the moment what are you working on now what's floating Luke Carter's boat yeah absolutely so um I say I've always been into science and technology and I always love building things whether it's you know high voltage equipment all sorts of things audio equipment love my electronics engineering mechanics how to fit all them things into your life it does work. I believe in right timing as well. So I love the property, we're doing property, which evolved into um, obviously the family office to kind of have an umbrella investment vehicle, uh, both separately and together um, to do our business activities and to host a, a raft of things that really float our boat. So that turned into funding property, funding for scaling businesses, uh, banking, commodities, trading, things like that, all things I really enjoy. And I find it fascinating that you can explore so many things within business, but then literally peel back the layer and put like a theme in there. You could start a, a new company that is technology based, but use your business skills for that. You can innovate something um, in that space, you know, with, with the same values. So I find that really interesting. So, you know, day to day, we focus mainly now on the funding and the scaling business lines, credit lines, uh, trade import finances and uh, commodity um, deals and trades and that's kind of the day-to-day -day, as well as the property um, side of things and the funding for that um, so in that process we get to see so many kind of novel companies that are growing and add adding unbelievable value to the world we get to see where the money and investments flowing globally as well which is really fascinating which often predicts the changes that we might see in future which I find uh, really interesting because you can have so many ideas that potentially could could go forward but when you see where the um the large money's going it is quite an interesting predictor of what drives the world does the world need to make any changes was that purely a financial thing and not great for humanity it gives you a lot of insights that make you think beyond the business and that's what i've always tried to do everywhere i've gone in life is to see beyond the financials see what does it give me as a person like i've always tried to almost avoid deals and finances even if it's to my gain um because i ask myself the simple question well what's the cost of that money how much is it costing me personally is it an alignment does it um does it uh, fulfill all my values and i find that you just often can't go wrong with that it's not saying you're accepting less but when you put that in front first and then have the uh, drive to achieve more you, you're you're naturally going to do better than you even thought you could because it, it's in it, resonance. I, yeah, I, I agree. I guess it gives your model longevity 
and also peaceful night's sleep as well. If you're kind of sticking to your values, you know that you're going to be comfortable in the position, even if it takes you a little bit longer on that journey. Yeah, and often I've found that when I've stuck true to them, the opposite's <laughs> happened because I've had an underlying belief that I was doing to, uh, going to do great regardless. Yeah, there's ups and downs in that journey, but I've often found the outcome has been even better than the initial thing that might not have resonated. So um, it, it has always seemed to work for me. I always tend to put my emotion my true emotions not my kind of reactive emotions mm. try and put my true desires first see what i want to achieve emotionally and then work from the top down to say okay what what can kind of fulfill that on a daily basis on a monthly basis go from there now i understand um and from what you said as well that you're you're pretty analytical and from the idea of following the money, so to speak, you're, you're what I'd call a futurist as well. You were look, you were trying to spot those trends. <clears throat> what sort of trends have you seen in the last sort of say six months? And what do you think? Just pick one or two, maybe. And what direction do you think that's taking us in? I mean, let me kick off with an example that Lloyd's Bank over here in the UK recently announced that they were going to get into the private rental sector. Um, I don't know if it's a coincidence, and maybe this is a bit conspiratorial, but uh, it, it happens to coincide with the biggest kind of crunch on consumer credit and mortgages and interest rates going up, etc. So what better time for a bank to get in than when it's going to be calling back in a lot of mortgages? But that, that's that's probably quite a cynical view on things. But what kind of trends have you seen over the last sort of six months or so? Or where do you think they're going? Yeah, I think they're definitely there's, there's a massive shortfall of uh, liquidity but well, it's probably not. They're just they're appetite, I guess. Um, portfolios change quite massively with obviously <laughs> the interest rates. It makes people make um, massively different decisions. Like going back into the COVID time, we got involved in a lot of kind of um, uh, paper notes and um, you know MTNs and things like that. Instruments that finance uh, financial institutions were after. So we we were actually kind of plunged into a market that. Um, yeah we hadn't really seen before like a massive uptake of you know lenders running out of finance so they used to go to um you know large institutions and um now them institutions are buying kind of fixed income instead of um actually lending out so that was interesting so we we actually developed a whole new business model around that on one side we we're kind of serving the market with a fixed income notes on the other side we we're helping the um uh, large institutions raise raise more money and capital and the funds and things like that and i think it's just a continuation of what's been happening i mean that the lending market's never been like this for a long period of time now where there's literally so much capital but it's not being deployed by the major institutions you've had the uprising of challenger banks of private credit um, organizations and i think you get a better deal off them and that that competition in the market is I think the consumer is getting more flexibility. Like, yeah, you might get a great rate of an institution, but they, they certainly want their security off the back of it. And that doesn't help, we found, um, hardly anybody grow. It is a massive bottleneck um, where loan to values and um, the lending appetite is so poor. I see a lot of uh, developers and scaling companies, they now need these bespoke solutions. But it's great because, you know, institutions, um, they, they can't offer the same as challenger banks can. No, I think outside of the institutionalized lending, you're more likely on both sides of the deal to get perceived fair exchange, both sides being happy with the transaction, mm. the lender perhaps being a little bit more commercially astute because they don't have a line manager who has a line manager, etc. So I think it's quite a, quite an exciting sector. It also it is also kind of runs counter to what I feel we're seeing as well in terms of trends. And that is a kind of a very subtle or perhaps even insidious sort of drift towards a centralized digital currency. I mean, we've heard about Bitcoins, you know, Rishi Sunak's mentioned that. W mm. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think, do you see any sort of trends for that? I really like the digital space. Um, I think it's fantastic. Um, I do need to probably constantly make myself aware that all these changes coming through, we need to be mindful. Are they helping the wider public though? Because if we have, obviously, a central bank um, digital currency, I do worry how that would affect um, some of the uh, the financial pairs on the market. Uh, what would happen to that? We obviously, there's a lot of talk about debt reset. There's a lot of talk about how that might manifest everybody day to day, how your money might be tracked, controlled, um, in the interests of greater security and things like that. So whilst I don't 
I never like to use the conspiracy theories as a negatively um, kind of um, angled subject, but I like to know about what might be going on behind the scenes to better prepare our positions and, you know, our place in the economy. And that helps us grow as well. So I do have some concerns about the, the central bank digital currencies, uh, for sure. I think in some ways they'll give people a lot of more freedom. Um, definitely a pros and cons list. I mean, like the remote working and the, the the totally change of structure in such a short period of time due to COVID, I think has been largely positive for the, the nation mm. overall. It's made people, yeah, sometimes collapse mentally, but that's probably because they've never asked themselves simple questions that we ask ourselves on a daily basis, like, are we happy? And suddenly they're asking them questions after 20, 30 years and the answer is actually, well, no, I wasn't. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, these changes can be good if we implement them right. Yeah, it's that's a really interesting point. I suppose it's like a, a, too much of anything, too much money, too much alcohol, too much success. It's only going to make you more of what you already were. It's not going to change you fundamentally. So if you arguably, you know, the whole, you know, working from home sort of movement, which I think is, is as you said, largely positive. I think for some people who were given freedoms that they hadn't experienced pre-COVID were probably a little bit lost, you know, and required mm. the structure of working in an organization, of being in a building and being as part of a team day to day. I think that's I think that's a lovely spot. Let's um let's jump sideways a little bit because that's I could probably talk about that all the time, but there's so much I wanted to cover with you, Luke. Um sure. you recently wrote a book, Darkness to Light. What prompted you to take on a project like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'd had a, a quite a difficult period for a number of years of mental health challenges and things like that. And I was working through them diligently. I, in my opinion, done a great job of recovering and actually believe that to be recovered, you need to be always recovering because you always need to tend to your mental health, really. And um, yeah, so in um, so I had my daughter in 2018 um, and that was quite a big... Uh, you know, impactful change in my life. I wanted to do the best I could. COVID hit. It wasn't that I wrote a book in COVID because I actually quite enjoyed um, a lot of the elements of COVID. I'm quite a reserved character. Um, but yeah, I wanted to... So over the... So what actually caused the, the book to be written initially was I started writing quotes when I was quite down. I was quite, I was really in a bad place. I started writing little quotes to, you know, not make myself feel better, but to express myself write poems, quotes, things like that, little articles, always written quite a lot, but I didn't really understand what they were for. Sometimes it had a target audience, sometimes it didn't, sometimes for myself, sometimes for others. So in that process, I started to notice as I was like um, 80, 90 quotes into this, that these quotes are actually almost, um, well, they, they were written at the time, they were capturing like a crystalline version of my emotions and where my headspace was. And as I was starting to look back on my journey of, oh, I'm, I'm really starting to recover well now. It's like this V-shaped recovery. I started to notice, well, these quotes are capturing, in a funny way, my emotions and my drive, even behind the scenes in ways you couldn't express in, in the words that are in there, they had much deeper meanings. That was my journey. So I thought, right, um, okay, I, I'm not far off. I'm, I'm doing quite well now. I'm, I'm I'd consider myself pretty much recovered. Um, it's, I'm going to write 111 quotes and that, that's going to be my recovery and beyond. So I didn't set myself a time limit for that because I just didn't want to. I thought it had to become natural. It had to come naturally to me. So sometimes I'd be out running and two or three quotes, that I, I'd put them in my, my quotes app on, on, on the route, still running and done a good job there <laughs> um, at the same time because it had to be decanted into my mind and I actually found that I was adding quite a lot quite quickly and then sometimes there'd be nothing but I didn't mind it's fine when inspiration strikes so then I, I thought well, I'm going to publish in, this into a, a novel book like a, a really strange concept where this is my journey from kind of uh, depression to succession I suppose which is the tagline of the book um, in that format and I, I reached out to a few people I knew and they said well, hey, quotes books are great, especially by uh, men at the time. Not many in that regard. So the emotional aspect, I suppose. And then I thought, well, this could provide a lot of uh, a source for uh, of great strength to people. And I was told, well, why don't you like put a story, like or at least like a, um, you know paragraphs of relevant content in between? I thought, 
okay, that, that could be quite a daunting task. I mean, and then it dawned to me, well, I could write my backstory. So I thought, how oh, am I going to, that's, that's a lot of content. I've never written a whole book before. How do you even start? So then what happened is I just divided the quotes into groups of fives. Um, and then I obviously decided to write um, a chapter. Per, so we ended up with like 22 chapters. But yeah, over the course of just doing literal menial tasks around the house and stuff like that, I'd just another chapter name would come to my uh, mind. I'd get my notes out on my phone. And all of a sudden, three days later, I had the whole structure for the book written. And then I went into a um, sub um, uh, category on the notes and just went like, well, you know, what, what are we going to, what's relevant? What's relevant in my journey that fits them headings? And it was all like amazingly decanted from my mind in quite a good chrono chronological order. So I thought, okay, let's just write this. So it took me seven months uh, doing one chapter every, you know, every so often and proofreading them properly. So I put together finally a book in that period that was all fully proofread and produced in a home version. And one of the driving forces was um, writing it as a manual for my daughter, Olivia, to nice. kind of uh, leverage my life challenges for the best, but in an open way. So yeah, that's how that manifested. And I was, you know, I'm pleased to have produced that home version that is already ready for people to read and, you know, for her to read. And that after I finished, I didn't even want to share it with the world. I kind of like, that's my therapy really, you know, in leaps and bounds, it, it done a lot of therapy for me. Therapeutic effect was unbelievable. So yes, I might produce a commercial version, but the home version was the most important to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a couple of questions we'll, we'll start with the sort of the the dry one but do you do you have a process for writing do you have a space for example and do you sit down and say right I'm going to do a thousand words today and I'm going to do it before 7 a.m or do you just as you said just bang something out mid-run or as you're walking around making a cup of tea in the kitchen yeah I always found that um I've always been a believer in natural flow and energy and you know law of attraction things like that from a scientific or a spiritual point of view so we start off that's why I started off with the structure that came to me naturally I believe in divine timing and things like that and you know going with your gut instinct I'd start the first few words sometimes I had no idea where it's going but the it was a start and that's all you needed Any anytime I've had to write something that had a meaning for someone um, you know that's how it started and you know moments later I'd produced you know 500 words a thousand words maybe even 2000 in you know, half an hour, I'll get the first draft of that chapter done. And then I'd save that, open a new file and start editing it and finalize it because my mind likes to do things as I go along and it provides a much less intimidating thing that I'm not going to make changes really after that as such. I'll do the improvements at the time. And that's, that's how I did it. So for largely, uh, for the large part of the writing process, it was very seamless for me um and it's quite a joy to write really instead of the intimidation um, of writing a whole book and 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 from the sounds of it it was also very cathartic as well as as you said sort of a self-healing process to do that journey through through writing absolutely it gave me way more than i ever thought it could i mean to the point where i didn't really feel i needed to share my story with the world i mean i still think it could benefit many many people because it's written in that style um but yeah it's a uh, it was certainly an eye opener for me, and it's kind of it helped me to see the world in a in a more. Um, I always wanted to do that, you know, the one percent, one percent, three percent rule. You know, consistency every day. That's what my goal was, and I constantly have to work on that because I have a habit of freaking myself out by think, uh, thinking too much in the the future and causing anxiety. So that that's one thing I constantly work at. But yeah, having that set routine of, you know, there's no time limit. I'm working off of natural flow. It's easy. And then I've, often I found that when I'm doing the task, I was so much fearing. It was it was like nothing. So the more I instilled that process of, hey, you've done this before. Um, this was the outcome. Just repeat, repeat, repeat. Now the natural cycle is, um, is, is a new habit. And people think, yeah, but it's so hard to develop your, um, how have you got all these like habits that are really difficult to achieve I said well they're not difficult to achieve once you've actually set them in your mind it's actually more difficult not to achieve them because that's just the program isn't it yeah you get to a 100%. point where like even with exercise right, it's harder not to exercise 
And that's what people don't realize. It doesn't have to be out of reach for people to change their whole life. No, no. I, I had the same conversation yesterday, funnily enough, with the guy who gave me the tree analogy. And um, my uh, watch buzzed as we were there having a coffee and it said, oh, time to move. It was, you know, one of those prompts to, you know, get sort of active. And yeah. he said, oh, do you, do you not sort of like stress out and get panicked and stuff like that? I said, no, because it's kind of become ingrained. Um, and I know it's a good thing for me. And as you just said now, look, it, it would be odd for me not to be doing those things. I, I say this every time I speak to people as well, by having that structure, having a framework, you actually end up with more freedom in your life. You know, it was a, a quote from Jocko Willink, I think, the, the ex-Navy yeah. SEAL, who said that, you know, freedom lies within the discipline. So yeah. I know that if I've got a structure to my day, I'll get to the end of it and I will feel so much happier than if I just have a, hey, well, let's just see how it goes kind of thing. Yeah, I'm a big believer in that. So, um, obviously, from a spiritual standpoint, it's a sentimental standpoint. A lot of people believe that, you know, to be truly happy, you be, have to be doing exactly what you want. Well, I think that's a very fine line because sometimes what you want is not what you actually want. And that sometimes it's driven by the programs and the limitations. And that alone is a big danger in my in my view. So if you're being tough enough to stick to your your original intentions, you're actually unleashing that freedom more than you ever could because now you are controlling and creating your life compared to being you know living in a moment that is defined by your past yeah i love that's very true what one of the things that i try to live by and i, I instill in my two kids is is this idea that thoughts become feelings feelings become actions and then the actions elicit reactions from the world around you so yeah. effectively, you are the creator of your own life. It's just most people don't bother having good thoughts or even bother thinking at all. Yeah, there was one other question that that, that your um, conversation on the book rose, um, and you mentioned 111 quotes. Now, I'm not a numerologist, and I don't play one on the internet. But is there a significance to the 111? Yeah, it's like an angel number. It's it's quite a high vibrating 1111. You know, one one one. They're all kind of divine. And in fact, I had a bit of a funny. Uh, funny way of um, signing off in my head not only would it feel right say the number of words in a chapter I'd look at the word count I'd put them in in google at uh, the word count and I'd just type um, um, angel number following it and usually it would come up with something quite specific um, to do with that combination of numbers and if I felt that I was in good relation and resonance to the chapter I'd be like that's the word count I don't care that's it um, even if I have to change one full stop or change one word, that's the word count. <laughs> and that gave me, okay, it sounds a bit rigid, but it, it was it was part of the natural trust in the universe and the trust in myself I had. Uh, but it was also uh, a way of um, really getting on and writing the content. I love that. that. But that's also a very real life example of, you know, within, you know, freedom lies within the discipline. You've set yourself a framework there and it, it, and it kind of manifests itself as a consequence. Yeah. Um, let, let's come back to the um, footballing father. Um, obviously, I, I, I've met you through through your dad, Jimmy. I want to talk to you and, and understand your experience, but we'd be it would be remiss of me not to say what were you aware of and how do you think that shaped you as a kid with your dad? I mean, your, your, your dad had a pretty illustrious career. There's big clubs there that he was at. And you, did you go along for the journey? Were you sort of in one home base to minimize disruption or how, how did, how did that career impact your growing up? Yeah. I mean, nowadays uh, we always have a, a private joke of um, every time I mention him, it's like, yeah, you're rinsing me, <laughs> you know, um, but you know, I, it's so important where your, your background your heritage your your parents what they did what they achieved your your grandparents um I'm a big believer in that so so why not I mean yeah there's times where I struggled over over the years with uh, feeling good enough I suppose um never in a in a way that was a, as a result of the upbringing but just a natural fact and I think that's quite common amongst people that had parents grow up in the limelight and have a lot of attention Growing up, it was quite simple. I thought it was absolutely normal to have all these big names around the house, um, you know, going into training, giving giving little um, pictures and stuff to give to Ian Wright and him um, following up with giving him uh, on a cassette tape, like his own mixtape, um, like his actual uh, singing and rapping. Um, it's got that somewhere. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's absolutely normal. Um, it was great looking back, actually. It was a lot of opportunity 
there's a lot of um kind of mindset around where challenges um are embraced and um life is for living and this is what we're going to do we're going to live on our terms and i very much enjoyed that style i thought it's um you know some people are very scared of giving uh, negative experiences to children potentially negative ones i don't think there are any really but actually what i got from all them challenges was that's what you can achieve as uh, going through them you can achieve xyz and you're the least that's going to happen is you're going to get better and the more you learn from seeing other people's experiences but probably more powerfully your own is the fact that you know if you repeat it a certain number of times your mind already knows that there's going to be a reward for pushing yourself through it so that's half the challenge done you know and i always believe that i mean i love financial trading i think it's, it's a big part of me and i love how it relates to the real world and human emotions but if you break it down you've got the financial markets they're they're in fractals so what you do on a monthly basis is actually reflected on a lesser part in the daily basis the hourly basis and things like that and that's what i try and do i try and do little things knowing that one of my favorite quotes is um, not i didn't write this but um small hinges open big doors yeah. and it's you become what you do constantly so yeah i was brought up with a lot of vibrancy with a lot of possibility with quite a lot of risk taking as well but you know like um yeah like the entrepreneur uh rob moore i, I love his quote if you don't risk uh, anything you risk everything and i really like that because it's so true and you've got to, i've seen the also seen the radiance of being around you know parents that are doing things that they love and that they're true to because you get happy people and when you've got happy people who are also you know embracing each other you get happy children and nothing in that process is to do with challenges and what happens to you it's all how you respond to it meaning it's all in your power exactly back to the uh how you uh what the thoughts are that you're processing and and that's another big thing i i talk about um with with my kids in particular is, is being responsive not reactive there's a very there's a big difference it's not even subtle you can yeah. respond to a situation in a very positive way even if it's not uh even if it's not a very positive scenario um, yeah no, I, I like that there's a lot we could we could delve into there i mean if if you're willing as well arguably and please you know if you don't want to sp speak about this just tell me arguably the foundation upon which this was built and and your father's success too would be what was really quite a remarkable grandfather it, is that something you could maybe tell us about if you're willing to yeah absolutely I've, i always believe in the sacrificing process because yeah whilst you it's good to have a, a cup that's always full I think it means more to people and especially to children seeing that if you're willing to give up X, Y, Z to um, in order for someone to have a better life. I think that's very overlooked in the process of always having a full cup because it's not always possible. And sometimes, you know, even if you can't do something, your best intention is always remembered by your children. Um, so that that's going to be quite powerful uh, growing up. Obviously, you grew up in, in the city, London, had a, a tough upbringing and um Likewise, my uh, um, other sets of grandparents, they've all had interesting uh, kind of upbringings and um, difficulties. And I've, I've loved how um, they all kind of stayed true to themselves. And they, you know, I think the best thing you can do to honour previous generations is actually try not to make, make the same mistakes because they went through so much hardship to get to their level. The best thing you can do is actually to go from there, not go backwards because they've already done the hard work in that respect yeah and i love that. i completely completely agree with you that's very much my i mean my parents have passed on now but for me it's very much about thanking them for the foundation that they gave me the opportunities that they've given yes. me and then to make sure that what i leave to my kids and grandkids will be you know an not an improvement but an enhancement you know a growth of that legacy Let, let's take a, a a quick break from um the sort of the longer answer questions now and i always like to do a quick what i call the three two one mm -hmm. round of questions um could you share three short and sweet pieces of advice that you'd give to aspiring parentpreneurs people who are you know parents but also wanting to start or are at an early stage in their entrepreneurial career yeah i mean I don't think you should go into entrepreneurship with the attitude that it is going to take all your time and it's going to be just a complete journey of sacrifices. But it doesn't need to be all the time. There's probably going to be peaks and troughs in that. It's not a complete uphill battle. And obviously the, the joy from doing something true to yourself 
um, is going to massively impact. And what a lot of people don't realize is they think, okay, well, financially, if there's a problem, uh, something uh, along them lines, and I'm, I'm taking a, a big risk. Um, but what I find, if you've got the correct mixture of mindset, you're going to do even better than you ever thought you could, um, surpassing any of them financial goals just by being in resonant with what you want, but not just being in resonant with what you love, also believing that you can achieve the better. So I don't believe there has to be a compromise there at all. So that's one one many uh, one of one of the things I would say um, to people. Um, second thing is you know make a start and be brave because along along the journey of this kind of fear and improvement continuum actually your your life achieved uh, you'll be achieved in far greater abundance kind of similar to the, the first point really if you overcome your fears like you think oh i can't do that this is going to happen xyz is going to happen but actually if you really want to have faith in this life the, you can't have the fear at the same time because it's the opposite of faith being like a religious person that's even easier to understand like have you got faith in a higher being you know um well then don't have the fear because how can you have faith and fear at the same time so what i tried to do especially last uh, few months is to recognize every fear that i can identify and deliberately try and face them and outgrow them and i found that my life's opened up in so many ways um, as a result and then of course i guess the advice is i uh, don't underestimate how much living in your true um kind of divine light so to speak can impact on your children's journey i think it's remarkable what children can learn from someone's journey um and interestingly that's there's no measure of the success part of that in there it's like how hard did this person try how much did they want to be this how much did they not want to give up how what's the what does the smile look like on their face compared to something that yeah pays the bills but they're miserable all the time you know that that's not a good lesson to teach your kids either is it so um yeah right, and at the gift in the pain yeah okay no thank you so that's 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 three uh piece of advice i love that two role models they can be alive dead people you know directly people you know vicariously or people you've read about in a book um yeah, obviously, I would say my, my parents and grandparents, I put them in one category wow. differently. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I always loved anybody that was absolutely true to themselves and was pioneering. One of my greatest models, probably Bruce Lee. I think he's unbelievable. That drive, determination and that uh, unwavering belief. It's kind of that unwavering belief when no one else believes in you. Um and that's what he had on his journey. And obviously he used that pain to provide the ultimate leverage in his life. And I think that's so important. Um, you've got to realize that, like, for example, if I suffered from low self-esteem, that could actually be arguably a strength greater than the person who never suffered from it. Because I've, I would end up doing more work on that subject than they might ever um, do on themselves. So I, I love all the shortcomings of myself now. I love that. I think Bruce Lee also gave me one of my favorite parapreneur quotes, and that was, don't give your kids what you never had, teach them what you never knew. And I think that's yeah. such a really good one. Oh, that's brilliant. So final one on the on the quick fire round. Um, I am going to hijack Bezos and Musk's network of satellites, and I'm going to give you complete control of delivering a message worldwide across social media, mainstream media. What would your one line approach to life be do you think what was your what is your mantra that you would would give to the world realize that everybody in themselves has the ability to be happy and to do what is best for them and often i see people tripping themselves up uh, by being horrible to other people wishing they were other people you know being jealous of their success when everybody's got a story and it is about choices and decisions now I always have a, a kind of analogy where I have a look at um, people that maybe want to do things, but they're jealous and, and stuff like that. They don't understand the journey I've been through. It has been tough at times, does tr provide tremendous freedom. But at the same time, you know, you don't have to have the same goals in life. I always kind of think that never have a problem with having a dream that is smaller than someone else's because that's your dream. It's going to make you happy, you know, at the end of the day. 
so that that's another important thing go for your you know your true kind of uh, moralistic uh, things but also realize that it's very much up to your decision making process like you can choose to um guide your soul in a different direction you can choose to be happy and to be happy for other people and realize that actually why don't you learn off these people that you want to become um because i always want to meet someone who's more successful more better at um, xyz than i am and that i guess that takes a big uh, person to do that i realized that it's not all, always very um easy doing that process but it gives me such tremendous value and I think seeing myself, I see myself, uh, I wrote this uh, statement, like a mini piece uh, a while ago, like, I want to be a cog, because there's someone before me and someone after me, I'm teaching someone, and uh, someone's teaching me. And that's how the world should go around. And we can all, you know, we're not all going to the same destination. So we can't compare anything, we can only share our human experience. Uh, I love that. I think I think that's very, very true. Your Your, your journey is is not relative your journey is kind of unique and absolute it just happens to be in conjunction with everybody else whether that's energetically or just you know because by dint of being on the same planet uh, thank you for that i like that um so let's discuss balancing family and business how do you ensure that your family's needs are met um it, it, do they kind of take priority or do you have a sort of does it ebb and flow i think that's been an interesting process because whilst I always have them as a priority also it's that guilt thing isn't it that you touch on mm -hmm. sometimes and that was very much linked to my self-esteem as well I, I always tended to do more uh, for others than myself which is great and I, I don't regret any of that but I have adjusted it a bit to be largely operating from putting a lot of my own needs not first but putting me in a position of strength and knowing that I can provide even better um kind of family interaction if i'm fulfilled in my own self and I'm, I'm providing a better message because if it isn't working if i'm not achieving what i want to be achieving then i can't really preach anything you know you're not doing it dad um you're you're you're, you're not being happy you're not doing this so it can't really come from that angle so that's definitely very important for me to um put myself uh, first in some situations knowing that the larger goal you can't just put yourself first and not think about anyone else that's that's no good either um but yeah instilling my values on a daily basis but also recognizing um the individuality um of my child um it is very important to me as well um work-life balance so yeah I, I i try to get excited as possible about what i do and i always have this thing that, of how i judge my life path I never want to take a holiday away from my life. I've never believed in that. Uh, I've always believed that your life is your holiday. And the challenges are, you know, if you learn to love, I wrote a quote um, yesterday night, thinking about the podcast, that, you know, if you learn to love the bad days, then, you know, your, your whole garden of roses is going to bloom. And um, that's very important. Like I'd live by that stoic thing of like overcoming your fears to the point where you're, you're not subconsciously thinking about that so you're setting a goal but you're not you're not fearful to the outcome and then you often get an outcome that you didn't even know you could create because that current level of thinking didn't facilitate it and yeah I, I tried to teach her every day that I do do the things I want I do put myself first and if I need time off I take time off I look after my own mental health um and yeah, sometimes work will come last, sometimes it will come first, but it's it's always that balance. It's the balance of what makes you, uh, you know, the, the best achiever you can be, because sometimes I take more time to create inspiration, little time action, but that action is very well planned and it's more effective than, you know, a hundred times of something else. So recently I've, I've been of the mindset that, yeah, you know, what about all the self growth? That's part of my business too. So say I'm doing X, Y, Z meditation, self growth, overcoming fears. That actually was the same. I can put it in the same as getting a deal done because all that led me to identify better deals, to uh, have a different mindset, to overcome my fears, uh, reach for the stars. So I don't see that as any different as your working day. 
And yeah, and I, I, I espouse that mentality as well. It's it, it's not about goals because very often you get to a goal and realize that, okay, it wasn't as fulfilling as I expected or you get to the top of a mountain and you realize there's another mountain just over mm. the horizon. And yeah. I think if you uh, don't enjoy day to day, then you're missing out on the journey that is your life and work, family. I think that's all a, an integral part of that. Yeah, and perfectionism is an issue as well. Like I love um, the certain elements that are unbelievable within that that really drive you forward. But there are some damaging parts, like not being happy with your results, or even if a result came too easy, you start thinking, "Well, I didn't work hard enough to get that," and you start feeling guilty. It's like, no, actually, you know, one one really strong point I've been I've been proud of myself for working on is saying to life, like it's integrity to the cause thing. Is like it doesn't matter if it's difficult or easy. If it's right for me, I'll do it. So. Yeah, some people have difficulty like maintaining their true values when something difficult happens. But there's a whole host of people that aren't able to accept something when it was in their natural flow either. And that's a big problem. You've got to take what life gives you because you've done the work at some point to get it. It might have been a year earlier. You know, you've done the groundwork, haven't you? So what has bloomed is yours. Yeah, I, I agree. It's like having that, uh, the quantum leap, the actual leap itself takes no effort whatsoever, but yeah. getting to the point where you launch yourself into it, that's that's often overlooked in terms of the journey. I think celebrating one's successes, small or large, is hugely undervalued. And it might be something to do with the sort of, I don't know, the sort of the Anglo-Saxon sort of Puritan work ethic, perhaps, you know, because mm-hmm. I don't think you get that in the States. You get people high-fiving each other and you know giving each other medals for you know relatively minor success but yeah i think it might be a a cultural thing as much as anything yeah no definitely so you're obviously part of a family office so working with a family upper generation is is something that um you're familiar with what are your thoughts on involving your daughter um in in the coming years obviously five years old is probably a touch young to be um sort of trading uh you know financial notes and dealing in property yeah. but is it something that um i know and you said earlier you know your journey is yours your dad's was your dad's but is that something that you would welcome and encourage i wanted to be her best self for whatever she wants to do at the end of the day I wrote in the family office chapter so when i when i originally founded the family so it, it did have a lot of values around family of course i mean in the tra- traditional finance sense that's kind of what a family office is as well because you do get some old-fashioned heritage-based family offices that do they are private family offices they're run by family members um and there's some that aren't um so i wrote in the book that there was a very big drive for me to form the family office not just as an investment vehicle and suppose some sort of um way of life and inspiring uh, my daughter um, and generations and things like that and giving them the means and tools um, so not only financial capability, but more importantly, their tools and mindset to do it that in whatever they do as well. It doesn't have to be like an succession based. I believe that the succession is the knowledge rather than what you're actually doing, because that can be extremely individual. But um, yeah, I wanted to give that toolbox mainly. Pass the toolbox on rather than necessarily the uh, the, the things that have been built from the tools. Yeah, like I love the quote, like, you know, um, you, you plant a tree in order to, uh, you, you you may not even sit under to get the shade, but someone else shade. will. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Funnily enough, that's the uh, that's the subtitle of my holding company is exactly that, for that oh, exact right. reason. Yeah. Nice, nice. So I love that. Um, so I appreciate you sharing the entrepreneurial journey and your and, and your journey as a, as, as a dad and a son. Um, where can listeners find you and learn more about you, your book, your writing, your your work? Where's the best place to find you, Luke? I'd guess LinkedIn, pretty good place. Um, so Luke Carter 07 for LinkedIn or the Carter Family Office.com um, is a good one as well. To I mean, I put a lot of heritage stuff up there because it's very important. Our values are very important with our relationships. And we've opened far more doors for ourselves and others by trusting being transparent and being decent in business um it's the long game for us um so it's very important how we come across and our relationships and how we leverage them um that's the most important thing adding value um other place i guess uh official luke carter on instagram but yeah i'd say mainly the website and the uh the linkedin 
and LinkedIn. Brilliant. I will uh, make sure that they're in the in the show notes. Luke, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, it's a pleasure. And thank you very much for your time also. That's brilliant. Folks, before we wrap up, I want to remind you to hit subscribe for more conversations like this with Luke Carter um, and other inspiring parentpreneurs. We are here helping you get more done with less guilt as you balance out your family and business. Luke, thank you again for being a guest and sharing your experience as an entrepreneur. And we'll uh, see everyone next time. Thank you.